Very few of us on a Saturday night are going to, hey, honey, what do you want to do? Hey, there's a speech. This guy's talking for an hour and a half. Let's go down and let's listen to it, said no one ever. So uh, with that in mind, that's how most corp- corporate meetings run. That's Dennis Ford. He's the founder and president of Quantum Leap Productions. It's an innovative and wildly creative corporate messaging company with over 25 years experience crafting unique corporate messages and creating entertaining and relevant videos, producing a myriad of original team building experiences for over 500,000 corporate employees and senior management. He realized there was a common denominator that every leader in every company talked about, but literally no one addressed effectively. So after digging into the guts of many of the Fortune 500 and 100 companies, it became his quest to actually solve a problem that every company faces. How to conceive, create, implement, and nurture a truly positive, effective, and joyful corporate culture. And even more important, how to create a truly profitable culture, one that contributes greatly to both productivity and bottom line revenues, at no cost to the company. Dennis has written a book about creating a positive and profitable culture called Monetize Your Culture, how to create a passionate, caring, and committed workforce that actually increases your bottom line and costs you nothing. The book is soon to be released and you can get information on our show notes. In his first career, Dennis spent nearly 14 years with C.B. Richard Ellis, the largest commercial real estate brokerage in the world. After seven years in sales, he became the manager of the Phoenix, Arizona office, leading it to the number one status among all C.B. Richard Ellis offices nationwide. Five of the seven years, he was named the senior vice president and was the number one rated sales and negotiation trainer company-wide. And Dennis, he also flies trapeze with a professional team, teaches trapeze, and has trained as a catcher. He flies with the iFly Trapeze headquartered in Long Island. You're listening to the Multifamily Leadership Podcast with Patrick Antrim. Your source for success strategies for multifamily professionals, CEOs, executive leaders, and aspiring leaders that want to drive high-performance results for their property or portfolio. This is Patrick Antrim, founder and CEO of Multifamily Leadership and producer of the Multifamily Leadership Summit, where top multifamily executives come together in a one-of-a-kind leadership summit to design fresh ideas for the future of multifamily. Welcome to the Multifamily Leadership Podcast, where I speak to executive leaders, authors, and business leaders on the topics that advance leadership in multifamily. It is our goal to give you insight into what top leaders are doing to re-envision the leasing experience and leading the apartment of the future. If you'd like to get access to other resources like videos, articles, show notes, other episodes of this podcast, or information on working with me, you can visit multifamilyleadership.com. 500 salespeople come into the big meeting. Uh, They're pulling them out of the field. They're spending a couple of million dollars. And then uh, management comes up with a holy grail of information. It's the stuff that people have to hear, believe, remember, and act on. So a lot of time and effort is spent crafting these messages. But so often, the moment that the message is enacted, is given, is brought to life, is some director of marketing standing up on stage right. and uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, PowerPoint slides with 60 bits of information on each one. And the entire audience is made up of type A personalities. We have the attention span of a gnat. So in four or five, six minutes, we're gonzo. We can look like we're paying attention, but trust me, we're not paying attention. We're, you're smiling. I'm smiling because we all do it. Everybody listening to this is going, oh yeah, I've done that. Right. So what, what our mission is with Quantum Leap is that we want to take that message and somehow put it in, in a medium that's far more compelling and memorable. So what, what do we go out of our way to see? Well, we go to plays, we go to films, and we do love stories, however stories told. Uh, Very few of us on a Saturday night are going to, hey, honey, what do you want to do? Hey, there's a speech. This guy's talking for an hour and a half. Let's go down and let's listen to it, said no one ever. So uh, with that in mind, that's how most corporate meetings run. So uh, we'll go back to Wiley's Widget Company and the, you know, the magical marketing plan. It's, it's what these 500 salespeople have to enact in the next year for Wiley's to be successful. 
uh, instead of the director of marketing with the PowerPoint slides, I'll take all of that information and, and usually cull it down. Uh, uh, most of the time, corporate messages are, are too detailed and too laden. So I'll try and take it to five or six really compelling things. I'll even ask management, what is it you really want people to do differently tomorrow than they did yesterday? Right. What is it you, you know, what, what do you want them to think? What do you want them to feel? What do you want them to do that's different? So that helps cull it down. And then the presentation of that marketing plan might become an all original musical comedy, a uh, cast mm. of eight, live band, six production numbers, fully choreographed, 60 page script. So it literally is like going to a local theater and seeing a hot musical comedy production only it's all about what you do as a Wiley's widget salesperson. Uh, because actually, the, the storyline isn't about the marketing plan. The storyline is about the people in the room. A, a cornerstone of Quantum Leap, or another one of them, is that we are, uh, or that I am my own favorite topic. If it's about me, you have my attention. Mm. It is a universal truth. Right. So we do interviews with the audience. We come up with all kinds of information that sometimes is not very congruous with management's message. But that being the case, we will gently lead those sacred cows out on stage and slaughter them. So we have the people in the room laughing about the very things that might even anger them. Safe, safely, right? I mean, it's, well, it's always <laughs> passed. It's always <laughs> passed by management. But when management balks and said, well, here's a perfect example. You know, some software, some CRM system comes out. And it goes to all the salespeople. And the salespeople say, wow, this sucks. This doesn't work for me. It's the wrong format. It's the wrong speed. It doesn't have the right fields. It doesn't work right, for what right. I do. And trust me, that happens a lot. <laughs> well, there's two ways management can go here. And this is what I'll say to management. is that This is the feedback we're getting. So if you didn't know it, you know it now. And they might say, well, gosh, I'm we don't really want to mention that. And I'll say, not only should you, you have to mention that. Because you give the people in the room two options only if you don't mention it. One is that you're dead from the neck up and you don't know it doesn't work. Right. Everyone else knows. Everybody else problem. knows. So they're going to think, wow, how out of touch are you? Because you don't even realize it doesn't work. Or two, you realize it doesn't work and you don't care. Mm. So... Those are the only two options you give your 500 salespeople in that room if you don't address it. Right. And it's costly to bring all these people together. Oh, it's, I mean, it's just the it, opportunity it, it, costs, the expense, travel costs. Millions. And then they just, you know, if it's not, if you're not engaging in this way, I mean, people are just PowerPoint slide and off to the next thing. And, and I'm guessing that, that virtually everyone listening to this has experienced that, where they've sat in a room mm -hmm. and been thinking about anything and everything other than what the information is that's coming mm -hmm. from, from that stage. Uh, and, and so pursuant to those sacred cows, if you will, uh, I work very hard to get management convinced that if you let me slaughter them comedically on stage, a, a couple of other things are going to happen. Your people are going to go, wow, are you cool and aware <laughs> yeah, that exactly. you get it doesn't work? And I think you're even cooler because we're making fun of it. Yeah. You're not defending it. We are all laughing about it. And, and you an, said it. <laughs> and an, an amazing thing about laughter, you cannot be angry and laugh at the same time. Right. Two states of being cannot exist. So you might have that bunch of salespeople in the room, and frankly, they, they are, they're loaded for bear on that CRM system. Right, right. And now they're laughing about it, and it's diffused. And there's magic in that. So going back to the storyline, it's about the lives of the people in the room. Management's message, that back to that holy grail of information, that becomes the solution in the context of a story. So we'll present some storyline that needs a solution. Now, I, I know who's writing my paycheck here, and I know whose message I'm honoring. And, and, and so ultimately, what I want is for that information that management crafted all those months ago for this big, big meeting becomes real and relevant and memorable and compelling. Wow. And, it, and it's done because it becomes the solution in the context of a story and is bolstered by hot musical numbers extolling how awesome it is that's that's great i want to come back to how you got inspired to do this but i mean you've been doing this for fortune 100 fortune 500 companies i think north of 500,000 uh, employees trained over over mm -hmm. this process and so if you're not a company that um 
can bring in this instrument or bring in your group? I mean, how do you how do you accomplish these things? Um, you know, without I mean, you you guys have a talent and a team, and you can you, the script. I mean, there's a lot of elements that come into making this successful. What could companies do? You know, to to accomplish this either on their own or work with what they've got? That's a really good question. And I, I hate to have a question that simply has no viable, concrete, workable answer. Stay with uh, the PowerPoint slide. That, well, <laughs> it, it's certainly not that. And, and actually, you know, you asked a minute ago how I got started on this. This story may actually help answer the question. Right. So uh, uh, years ago, I worked with a company called CB Commercial. Uh, now it's C.B. Richard Ellis, the right. largest commercial brokerage company right. now in the world, I think, that yes. C.B. Richard Ellis. used to be just the largest in the United States. And uh, so as a, a fairly high-level salesperson, uh, I used to chide our management all the time. Not necessarily in front of them, but we would go to meetings and we were the people saying, wow, that sucks. Uh, and wow, management doesn't get it and things like that. And lo and behold, uh, seven years into the mission, I was made manager of the Phoenix office. And so I literally started, I mean, I left Friday as a salesperson and I came back Monday as a manager. Uh, now, some training went on down the road, but that was a really weird transition because I certainly got along with our management, but I didn't extol their virtues You're all the time. One and of them. Certainly not the, the way they communicated. So I thought, okay. I can't keep having meetings the way they have meetings. I just can't uh, because I've been saying these meetings are awful for seven years. So, and this was a very small meeting and this is why it's relevant. So here's, we used to meet as departments. So at this time there was no quantum leap. Oh gosh, no. So it you're actually implementing it. This was the genesis of what became quantum leap. Okay. Uh, and it stewed for the six, seven years I was manager of the office. So my, my first meeting was of the industrial department. So I probably 22 salespeople. So these were very small meetings. The retail department would meet an industrial and apartment. Right. Like that. And I thought, okay, we're going to do this market overview. I can't just go in and do it the way it's always been done or else I will suck too. And so I thought, okay, I got together with a, a sales manager and I said, okay, what I want you to do is go in and start the meeting without me uh, and just say, Dennis is running late. He wanted to, you know, he just didn't want the meeting to start right. uh, late. So uh, uh, we have a guest speaker today. And he's a, uh, a very high level developer investor out of Dallas. And they've, their market has gone through many of the same things our market is going through now. Mm. And so we're going to get some perspective. And I don't even, I, just, the, I think I was the right Reverend Jimmy Braggart. So I come in. <laughs> I don't think you could do this today. This was a long time ago. Uh, I come in. White suit, white hair, white mustache, white shoes, white top to bottom, dripping in gold jewelry, gold Rolex, gold rings. And I was an evangelical uh, real estate investor. So we're talking about all the markets in Phoenix. <laughs> Only I started out and said, I heard the word. The word was I-17 corridor and I saw that it was good. Henceforth in my holy ordinance, the almighty created the big box rail serve building. <laughs> and so I proceeded to give the entire market overview <laughs> as, the, as an evangelical. Right. And, and then because I knew the salespeople so well, and, and trust me, these are wildly flawed people. I adore them. It's the highest <clears throat> level sales there is, I think, just about in the world. Right. And, and it is like herding cats. It, it, and so I proceeded then to uh, go person to person, not every about five different people, people, and I healed them. Like there was one person who used to be brutal with our administrative staff because he was just. So this is so the sacred, or this is dealing with the what's known, right? Like throughout. Oh yeah, yeah. So for instance, there's there's a, a salesperson who was just brutal with the the administrative staff when they're you know writing up contracts. This is long before computers where you would just do it on your own word processing. Right. So we had a typing pool, and then it was absolutely done on typewriters. And right, I right. know I'm really ancient, so I I would go to him and 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 I say, "There's one among you that has been known to be abusive." There is one among you who has gone to our lovely ladies and he has abused them. And, and so they kind of figure out what, because I'm wandering the room. And I get to him and I, I'm, I'm holding his head. And I say, out foul demon that makes it want to hurt the people. Out foul demon. And I heal him. And I mean, they were slain. 
all week, I got calls from people who weren't even in the meeting <laughs> saying, what did you do? I heard you, I, guys from other companies. And, and this little seed got planted that, uh, philosophical and pragmatic, and it was this. Okay, people are talking about the meeting. If they're talking about it, they were present for it, which means they remember it, which also means mission accomplished. Mm. Because I, I was able to have them laughing uh, uh, but I didn't change the information. Right. Uh, how, how do I say this? Our brains don't selectively decide what we remember. Mm. Uh, if you see a play or a film, let's say you and I saw a play 10 years ago, independently of one another, and right now that film or play comes up in the conversation, we could likely go, oh gosh, do you remember when so-and-so said this and, and we remember nuance and storyline and characters. Why? It's 10 years ago. Right. Why Visual. would we remember it? Well, we were engaged. We were entertained, right? And so th that truly was the was the the first sort of cornerstone inspiration. inspiration. Yeah, that that this is pretty cool. Now I couldn't do every meeting that I ever did like this, but I would pepper it, and I would surprise people, and I would create characters, and 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 uh, um, it it worked so well that national CB heard about it, and they would have me go to other meetings, and mm. then I became a. Uh, uh, I was a sales trainer in L.A., and I, 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 I don't mean to toot my own horn, but I became the, the um, highest rated sales tra trainer in all of CB, according to the training department. Right. A big part of it is I did characters. I did costumes. I, did, I didn't change the curriculum, but I wildly changed the delivery. Mm. And, and that's the mantra of Quantum Leap Productions, and I hit my late 30s, and I thought, well, I've had about all the fun I can stand. Uh, I've got an idea for a communications company that can do what I've been doing here on a much grander scale, right? Uh, and, and do it for companies all over, right? And, and that was 25, 26 years ago. We do uh, a lot of research around employee engagement and how companies can increase levels of engagement because now organizations and CEOs recognize, you know, there's financial incentives to to uh, actually invest in this process of increasing levels of engagement and one of the key areas we reach or research is uh, corporate culture and communications the communications element just do i understand the long-term vision of the company these types of things and so as companies go around and they're training their people and their uh, you know regional trainers or on-site trainers wherever they are in their business um, you know this this type of um, you know, sort of pattern interrupt, if you will, I guess, in, in the what to expect coming into a meeting, I guess, I guess would really kind of open the mind to, you know, uh, an engaged listener or audience member or what have you. And to have that memorable experience is pretty interesting. But so now you've written a book about this, Monetize Your Culture. Tell me how this transferred. You pretty much have studied this, implemented this, you know, throughout, uh, you know, many different organizations across the world. And so now you've got the book coming out. And is that what this is all about? Monetize your culture? Make sense to actually make, make, make it profitable? Well, one likes to think that we never, as professionals or as people, just lay there and wait to die, that we evolve. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, certainly technology evolves and our, a lot of things evolve. Sometimes we run with it, sometimes we don't. I didn't see this coming. I just had a realization, and it started a few years ago, that there was a common denominator in almost every high-level corporate meeting I ever experienced. And so here we're brought in, or I'm brought in to do the messaging. I'm not a culture expert. Mm. I'm brought in to do the messaging. But what I realized in the context of sitting with senior leadership in company after company after company after company is that they would talk about culture their, their own co corporate culture or corporate culture in general and have absolutely no concept of what it actually is and they would not understand theirs and they had no idea of the, the power or, or the relevance of culture to the point that, it, that I, I swear it was almost comical. I would have to hide snickering. I could, here I am at this high level meeting and they're saying things that, that literally were comical in their either ignorance or naivete about what culture is. Right. And, and, and if you asked four different people, you'd get four different answers anyway. Even if... I would... It, yes, that's absolutely true. 
And, and nine times out of 10, they're the wrong answer. Meaning that, here, here's a perfect example. Another story, I'm a storyteller. Um, a very big, big bank. Big, like third, fourth largest well in the world. <laughs> and um, so <clears throat> it's for their, a very large division in that bank. So I'm sitting with seven or eight senior leaders, president of the division and lots of VPs and people like that. And, um, and so here they are, and they're, we're talking about their messaging for the upcoming meeting. But then they just digress into grousing and complaining about their employees. Oh, their attitude sucks, and they don't do this right, and they don't do that right, and they don't appreciate, and we're trying to do this, and they're not embracing it. And I sat back and listened, and, and I thought, wow, is this the irony of all ironies? They have no idea they are the culture. Mm -hmm. So here they are complaining about their corporate culture vis-a-vis -vis the employees, and they have no cognizance that it's them. Right. And I just thought, wow, is this powerful. Even to the point, the theme for their meeting was culture shift. <laughs> so they were going to their people with this mantra, we're going to change our culture. You know what their culture shift was? It was a sales plan and a marketing plan. Mm. Well, never in the history of ever have a sales plan and marketing plan had anything to do with culture. Right. That's stuff. I mean, it's important stuff. Right. But it sure ain't your culture. Right. And so they thought that somehow by getting people to, I, well, no, I'm going to go the other way. They thought by calling it cultural, they could get people to embrace some new program. Right. And now my job at the time was not to talk about culture. It was to get their message across. And that's what I did the best I could. But it was years of this that led to this book, realizing how few corporations at the highest level have any idea what their own culture even is. And they certainly don't have a very good idea about the potential of a strong, powerful, joyful culture. Mm. And and it you now coming back to what you were talking about and the the effect it has pragmatically on the bottom line. It's right. not just feel good. I mean, let's uh, don't you wish the world was such a a great place that every company just wanted to be a Zappos or a Google or an REI or a Costco or a Starbucks where mm -hmm. you they just have these renowned cultures where you know you go on Glassdoor and everybody talks about how awesome it is to work for the company. Right. I mean, I think Zappos gets like. 500 applicants for every single position right? because they're renowned, but they're the exception. There's a handful of companies like that out of the thousands of companies that exist. I mean, literally a handful. Right. And, and so uh, I, I certainly wish that the whole business community would embrace a joyful culture just because, damn, isn't that nice? Right. Wouldn't it be a great thing to have people really happy right. about where they work? But what I realized is realistically, that doesn't matter. But what if I tie it to the bottom line? What if I write a book about creating a great culture and yeah, it's all those joyful, wonderful, passionate things, but you know what you actually end up with? Double digit improvements, depending on where you start in productivity and, and bottom line revenues. Because right. it's, and this is absolutely proven, that uh, scientifically or through studies that people who are happy and joyful and feel appreciated and feel respected and feel dignity do a better job and let me say that better than just a better job they put more into every single day that they work by double digits as a percentage of effort than the person who feels disrespected dissed uh irrelevant not, you know, not cherished in any way, not appreciated. And we're talking 15 to even 35% difference in effort. Right. I mean, just in product development, I mean, you need innovation to, to bring forward business today. And I mean, you're not going to innovate if you're not respectful. You're not creating that, that space for that creativity and candor. It seems to me that based on what you're talking about, this wide gap of what the culture is experiencing and what the sometimes top level leaders have awareness over, you know, grouchy employees or this department is doing this or that, or you had mentioned uh, in our earlier discussion about, you know, cultures, they don't begin at the bottom, right? It starts at the top. This is one of the great truisms. I, I passionately believe this and I am 
utterly confident when I say, and I don't use the words never and always very much. I think if you're wise, you stay away from those words. Uh, I'm going to break my own rule, and I'm going to say never in the history of ever has a culture of a company, a group, a, a sports team, a fraternity, a sorority, an association, never has it started at the bottom and worked its way up to leadership. That's not how cultures develop. Mm. Cultures develop from the top and they matriculate downwards in a series of expectations and feelings and behaviors. And, and, and that's how we learn a culture. That's how we're absorbed into a culture. And that's how we become that culture. And I'm absolutely positive of it. Let's talk about communications. I want to follow up to that point. Um, you know, the, the executive leaders are, you know, they, they're working. They're, a lot of our listeners are high-level executive leaders, entrepreneurs, CEOs, those that are innovating new technologies today, even in the world. And so when that, when that leader gets to that point, they, their, their role shifted. I mean, your role shifted as a manager when you became the sales to the manager. And when you get to that high-level leader, um, there's a lot of, um, structures in the corporate um, workplace that has the um, they're sort of protected from the candor now for me when I started uh, I retired with the Yankees went to work for the US ambassador to Spain former owner of the Mariners and I became his personal assistant press apprentice essentially and I was his fresh set of eyes so he was a 700th richest man in the world and one of the things that he was most interested was what are my people experiencing? How do we actually invest in the business to give them the best chance to succeed? So he was committed to candor, right? So um, he wasn't, he was, you didn't want to just go in and have a yes man kind of a thing, right? So he knew that the quicker he had the real information, the quicker he can make an investment, quicker he can make a move and technically help that employee reach their level or drive the business forward. So for companies that are experiencing, they get in that sort of, you know, uh, boardroom culture where it's, you know, they're own, they're, it's in a vacuum, right? We're not really. And then you got the employees who are running the business that are experiencing something entirely different. And so how do you encourage candor, an executive to either um, embrace candor uh, and so they can be more open you know, if they're not going to an event or um, a, you know, workshop or presentation where it's more facilitated by like mm -hmm. your group where it can be sort of naturally effective if it's just a one-on-one -on -one meeting how does the employee that's having trouble with xyz or how does the executive embrace that how do you col collapse that distance between them in, in that candor that's uh, necessary uh, listening a, a, well a great culture I, I mean the the candor what you're talking about and it's not just candor it's it's performance, it's excellence, it's joy, it's happiness, it's going above and beyond. There's, there's all these benefits to having a joyful culture, including in this market, particularly people who are going to stay with you longer because they don't want to leave the known happy culture because they're so few and far between. So, uh, so you, you bring it to a one-on-one -on -one level. I'm, I'm, I, I, in general, I'm taking it more from a company-wide level. Mm. But th I think the precepts are the same, mm. that there has to be trust and respect, uh, dignity, uh, not ownership of each other. Uh, I mean, there's an awful lot of managers that almost have an unsaid ownership over their employees, and it's very intimidating. It makes the employees not want to say what's going on. You said candor. They're not going to be candid. Right, gonna they, because they have one, multi, most companies have multiple flows of income. And so they lose an employee, and it's like, okay, well, it's a, it's a flick of a light, and it's out, and we're, we're still illuminated here. But the reality is, you know, the employee is out of fear if that culture is in place. They're not going to bring to the executive the real truth or the real issue because that's their one income, right? That's a big motivation. I, I, I just, I'm such a storyteller, but I just love stories. Uh, um, I hope I can talk about this. D did you ever see the movie uh, Office Space? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm going to guess a lot of you have. If, if, you, if you don't, 
if you don't know the film, in a nutshell, there's this poor employee and he's just beat to death at this tech company called Inatech. And he hates his life. Every single day is the worst day of his life. He actually says that. It's so bad. It's the worst. That means today was the worst day of my life. <laughs> and, and so he, he becomes hypnotized to just be able to leave it and relax and not worry about it. But during the hypnotism, the hypnotist dies. And it's left un, undone. He doesn't get to be brought out of it. So he leaves and he just has this, he's in this incredible state of mind where he doesn't give a damn. So suddenly he's in his company. Now he's talking to Bob and Bob. Remember them, the two consultants two that Bob's. are doing the layoffs. So he's meeting with Bob and Bob for the first time. And, 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 and they say, well, you know, tell us what a day is like for you. And he goes, well, Bob, I usually come in about a half hour late. I come in that side door. So Lundberg, he's the manager. So Lundberg doesn't see me. And I get to my desk and, you know, I space out for a couple of hours. Oh, no, space out. What, uh, what do you mean space out? He goes, I just stare at my desk, my screen. It looks like I'm working, but I'm not. And then I'll go to lunch, and I'll usually spend an extra half hour at lunch, and I'll space out again in the afternoon. You know, Bob, I don't think I do an actual 15 minutes of real work in any given week. <laughs> and if that doesn't resonate more than any of us actually want it to, right. that, that every employee every day, and this is another one of my truisms. I'm absolutely convinced of this. Every employee in every company every day has a choice when they hit the door. How hard am I going to work today? What is, what is my level of output going to be? Uh, the difference in I, I'll do just enough to not get fired and above and beyond. I once had a high level CEO, uh, a, a consultant who ran a group called CEO Forum. And I had, it's, I had told a story and it had to, it had to do with what motivates people. And, and I turned to him and I said, what's the difference between uh, above and beyond and I won't get fired today. And he looked at me and I asked sincerely, I didn't have a number in my head. He said, mm, 70%. And I went, Oh, come on, 70%. And he goes, yeah, absolutely. So I was talking to this group of CEOs and there was a CEO uh, with about 2000 employees among this group of 15. And we've been talking about incentives and contests and what do you do to try and increase uh, uh, employee engagement and productivity. And I turned to him and said, okay, let's just, for instance, let's have some fun here. What would happen if tomorrow your 2,000 employees showed up and forget 70%. I said, no offense, Jim, we, we, I, we're 70% out. Not, not even 35%. Let's just knock it down to 15%. What would happen if 2,000 employees tomorrow showed up and gave you 15% more effort just because they wanted to? And he, I swear his eyes almost rolled back in his head. And he thought for a second and he said, I honestly don't know. I can't even conceive of what that would do. It would have been 15% more effort. Right. And you knew, you could see he's kind of running numbers. And, and I, I don't even remember the industry he was in. It was manufacturing. And, and, I, and I said, and you know something? You talk about the expense of all these contests and incentives and trips and right. this and the that. The money's there. And, 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 and I said, this doesn't cost you a dime. This is creating a joyful culture where people feel respected and they feel dignity and they feel listened to uh, and, and, and they feel appreciated. Mm. Uh, that's the power of, uh, and, and again, that's several years ago, but this whole concept of culture was starting to gel in my mind that, um, you know, and it was one of those situations, Patrick, where you go, ah, oh, someday I'm going to write a book. Right. You know, and how many of us go, ah, someday I'm going to write a book. Right. It's a lot of work. Well, and it's daunting to even start. I, right. I mean, it's like, ah, where do you even start? And, and I just had a friend of mine who's a high level business consultant, and I, I was talking to her about working with her, and she heard these concepts, and she said, no, 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 we're not going to work together. You need to write a book. You need to get this down on paper, mm. and you need to talk about this. Right. Because people aren't talking about the monetary power of a healthy culture. Sure. There's plenty of people talking about, well, you know, a, a, you a healthy culture is nice. But she said, I, I don't know of anybody who's saying, work to create an intentional, and that's a really important word, an intentional culture because it's good for your bottom line. Most cultures, and not to go off on a tangent, but virtually every culture is haphazard and random. If you asked a company, the very leaders at the top, ask the CEO, how did your culture become your culture? They are going to look at you and say, I, I have no idea. It just always has been. 
Well, no, it hasn't. Right. And, Incrementally. And, and, and every group has a culture. I, if, if, if it's a five-person bowling team or, or a company with 20,000 employees and everything in between, every single one of them has a culture. It's almost impossible to not. Right. So what I'm advocating is a series of steps where you create an intentional culture. You, you start out by first understanding your own, truly understanding, all warts and all. You've got to be open as a leader. I'm going to take it all in, the good, bad, the ugly. And, and I'm not going to be offended. And I'm not going to be hurt. And I'm not going to be pissed. I'm just going to absorb it and know, okay, that's where we're starting. And, and then moving to, okay, what do we want to be? What would be way better than what I just found out? So now you define what the perfect culture would be. And, and once you've done that, and I'm not saying this is an easy deal. It's not. Uh, but then you go about creating it. And I have a series of steps that, that if a company goes through, it will end up creating a much more open, powerful, passionate culture. But one needs to be patient. Uh, I think we were talking the other day, and I equated it to, to uh, uh, changing your physicality. You know, you're overweight and, you know, your, your muscles have gone to seed and you go, gosh, darn it, I'm going to get back in shape. Well, if you've spent 20 years getting in bad shape, you're not going to change it in six weeks. Right. You just aren't. So if it's going to happen, you got to say, okay, I'm in this for the long run. I'm not even going to worry about it for a year. Yeah. Be committed and go yeah, for the process. I'm going to go. It's, it's going to be about process, not end game. I am in this for the process. And so you go to the gym and you, you, you regulate your diet and you do all the things you need to do. And if you see results along the way, great. But don't count on it because it's going to be a long process. And mm -hmm. I would say this to any corporate executive or leader. I would say if you're going to do this, don't even start if this is something that has to be done in three months. In your mind. Right. Because then they retreat because the results don't. It's not going to happen. Yeah. It, it, and, and, and but it so, will happen if they stay committed it, oh, to the process. I'm absolutely convinced because that's how cultures start anyway. Right. They start from a series of behaviors that are at the top of the company. So uh, abort or get rid of the behaviors that are driving unfavorable outcomes. Introduce new behaviors and stay committed to that process exactly over a that. long term. And, and, and take the scoreboard off it and just go for it. And get rid of people who can't buy in. Right, because they're going to hurt you. They're, they're, it's the proverbial bad apple, right. spoiling the barrel. That you have to have parity among your leadership team. Protect you need that them culture. All you, if you're going to create a new culture, they all have to buy in. Mm -hmm. They all being your most senior, senior leadership, and then the group below them that report to them, they have to buy in too. Mm -hmm. And the group that reports to those folks, they have to buy in too. Uh, some companies it would be more difficult to do than others if there are truly unhealthy cultures, but it's doable. It just might take longer. Uh, there might be some people who have to go by the wayside if right. they're not going to get on board. Uh, uh, I mean, things like and that's typical. A, 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 a great example, you, homegrown, is 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 Southwest Airlines. They had a great culture when nobody was talking about culture. When nobody used the word culture mm. 20, 25 years ago, if you, if you think back, those of you who used to fly, who used to be the most fun? Mm -hmm. who, when you flew, which was the one where the flight attendants could, could do comedy during their, their you know, right. onboard speech? There's your well, example. There, and where every where all other, of a sudden you're listening to the rules. Absolutely. Of, <laughs> and, and you're laughing and, and they, they were having fun, ergo you had fun. Even to this day, is there a single airline other than Southwest Airlines that does that? Because it, it, it's no the FAA rules, and we've right. got to do it this way, and we have to be serious, and we have, and and all of that was Herb Kelleher. I, I was just looking um, at uh, Hotel Tonight's. Uh, I, I followed Hotel Tonight's. Um, it's an app that you can book a hotel tonight, and it's uh, it's a pretty interesting uh, model, and younger company and. Uh, I was involved early on with the application before they became, you know, a well-known brand and things like that. But if you go to their career page, you know, their job page, it's, it's you know, there's a lot of uh, visuals and illustrations of their great culture. And it's pretty, pretty interesting because they're trying to attract great people to their, their organization and they need to fit within what their values are. But there's words on the page that, you know, that are like, hey, throw down and things that if you went to, you know, IBM or I don't want to reference IBM in a, in a negative way, but um, 
that are more that are more flexible and free that maybe is more interesting to uh, read like oh this is interesting you know a normal traditional corporation wouldn't say throw down <laughs> on you know <laughs> and and, and uh, the caveat to that is, is that the culture has to live the hipness if if indeed that's the card you know they're yeah, you can't play. make the promise and yeah, then not yeah, deliver exactly i was shocked because i was just doing some research a couple of days ago one of the top 10 companies for cultural joy and happiness you ready for this chevron Ooh. i was shocked i thought oh i mean if so you someone, don't have to be doing something interesting and sexy Exactly. And that, it, 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 and actually there are some high tech companies that have all the stuff, the free snacks and the, the dining rooms with free food right. and, and a keg, you know, on tap 24 right. seven and all these hip things. And you go on glass door and people are miserable. Right. They're overworked. They're underappreciated. They are poorly managed. Uh, they are not utilized, uh, pursuant to what their skill sets really are. Mm. Uh, and yet, here's a hip tech company. Then there's an old guard company, 150 years old or however old the parent company of Chevron is, and they're in the top 10. They're up there with REI and Zappos, uh, Google, Apple, um, Starbucks. Mm -hmm. I was shocked to see Chevron on that list. That's great. I really was. I was like, wow, I would not have thought that. Yeah, that's a great example. Uh, and so coming back to it, um, Early on, we talked about what culture isn't, but for the sake of what we're talking about, especially now, because you mentioned a manifestation of what could be a good culture, throw down, we're hip, we're cool, come here and we're going to have fun and work here's a joy. But the, 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 the bottom line is that culture is what we feel. First and foremost, what we feel about the workplace, our peers, it's our passion, it's our core belief system. And these are not cliches, I promise you. We all have a culture that, that's ingrained in our psyche. We go to bed with it at night, we get up with it in the morning. It's in every part of our lives. It's our sense of self, it's our sense of ethics, it's how we interact with the world. And it should be respectful and supportive and joyful and passionate and kind. Because who doesn't want to live that way? Mm -hmm. For the companies that, that have created an intentional culture with every facet I just said, they will keep employees longer, guaranteed. I absolutely flat out guarantee it. And so does research. Uh, they will have employees who on a daily basis give them more, who go above and beyond. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm, I, I well, keep going back Well, the real benefit, stories. though, is not only... You know, when you when you go into an organization, save uh, in our research program, those we looked back four years at those companies that participate in the program, and it's like, okay, well, you know, if you want to know if it's a great place to work, you ask people to work there, right? That's your first step, right? Then, how do we design something that takes us to a new level and get committed to that process? But when, when what we realized was twenty four percent reduction in turnover for those that just participated in the program, which means. Um, you know, just asking the employees what they think and feel sent a message that I care, we care. Now, there is also the problem that if you first ask and you do nothing with it, that can be even worse, right? Because you've decided I'm going to listen to you then, or I'm going to ask you and then I'm just, you know, we're not going to respond. But it was fascinating to see the levels of uh, uh, reduction of employee turnover. Now, the, the cost to replace an employee today is, you know, it's it's more competitive. You're going to reach more places and more. Uh, you know, it's really challenging. Thousands and thousands of dollars. So when you do the math on that financially, yes, this makes total sense. Now, the other thing that I really am interested in what you're talking about is when when you're talking about increasing those engagement levels and giving that extra effort. And even if it's at 15 percent to wow the CEO, the customer benefits from this. The people that were, I mean, a better engineered product. Right, a better coffee served at the at the bar, whatever that is, and that drives the top line and the experience referrals in the business, and it's just an inside out approach that I love. I love having the conversation with you about this. This well, is great. I I love that you had experience with a hard number on employee engagement 
uh, uh, being monetized. Mm -hmm. So what you just described is that a hundred person, a hundred person shop or company, mm -hmm. they're going to have 24 people stay that wouldn't have. Right. So that's 24 hires, 24 headhunters, 24 training protocols, 24 number of months until they're productive. Mm -hmm. There's all these financial yeah. indicators, as you said. Right. And, and, and all they did was ask the question, imagine if it really was uh, right to its core joyful. I, I was reading um, uh, a statistic that Harvey McKay, the old business pundit, mm -hmm. he still writes uh, sure. columns. And he cited it was the U.S. La uh, let me think U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics mm -hmm. that between the ages of eighteen and forty-five, how many times a person is going to change jobs? I was stunned. It was twelve. That's so different than my generation. Uh, that's so different than oh, yes. any generation that's ever happened. So that means it's it is inevitable. People are going to jump. But if you can keep someone a year longer or two years or five years longer because they are so happy where they are that they don't want to jump into the unknown. It's a little more money, but what if it's awful? Right. I'm so happy here. Uh, and, and, uh, and then the other side of it is that the sheer productivity side uh, based on someone being joyful in their task. Mm -hmm. I'm, and I don't, I'm not talking Disney whistle while you work, but it is a little bit. It, it's how people feel when they're doing what they do. Right. Aspiring their own, and, and, their and, own performance. And it's what motivates us at a very base human level. Uh, do you have time for one more story? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, one of the, one of the stories, uh, one of the chapters in the book is everything I needed to learn about business. Or, uh, I'm sorry. Everything I needed to know about business, I learned waiting tables. Mm. And so uh, uh, years ago, I worked at a place called Nantucket Lobster Trap. It was the premier seafood restaurant in all of Phoenix. Uh, it was the only uh, seafood restaurant that had fresh fish flown in every mm. day. It was busy from 530 uh, when the doors opened to 11 o'clock at night. Absolute plum job. I put myself through college waiting tables there. Nobody left. We had this crew of 13, 14 waiters, and, and they were just top of the game. I mean, we, we watched each other's back and we ran like a Swiss watch. So anyway, uh, I'm good at this. I'm a good waiter. So one night, packed as usual, uh, I noticed, oh, checks are down on four tables. So my, my station of four. And I thought, okay, uh, the hostess will stagger it. She's not going to seat me all at once. I go back in the kitchen to get something, walk out. Sure enough, all four tables. Now, I'm a good waiter, but I can't violate the laws of physics. I can't be in four places at the same time. Right. So now it's damage control. And I'm going, okay, I'm going to do the best I can. So first table, hi folks, how you doing? My name's Dennis, I'll be a waiter tonight and here's our specials. Let me tell you about the halibut, yada, yada. I go to the second table. Hi folks, my name's Dennis. Welcome to the Lobster Trap. Uh, we've got some special tonight and I hear behind me this, <laughs> finger snapping. Yeah. And I, I, I just kind of look over my shoulder, it's my third table. And there's this guy and he's got his finger, is snapping in the air and he's looking around. He's not looking at me. He's just looking around for someone to pay attention to him. And, and, and I kind of smiled at my people, and I was thinking, okay, this is going to be interesting. So I go to the third table. Uh, hi, folks. My name's Dennis. I'll be a waiter tonight. Sorry you had to wait, but I'm here now. We're going to get started. We're going to have a, a great night. So I get to my fourth table, a couple. And before I can say my name, he, he looks up at me, and he says, hey, Dennis, how you doing? Looks like you're having quite a night. And I kind of smiled. He said, let me guess. You got sad all at the same time, didn't you? And I went, yeah, I did. And he said, I'll tell you what. If you can have the cocktail waitress come over, we're just, we're here for the long run. We're going to have a drink and chat. You do whatever you need to do to get all squared away with those other tables. You don't even mm. worry about us. We are fine. When you have time, come on back. Tell us about the specials. And, and we're going to start our night then. It's going to be a great night. Nice. Now, somebody that night got the best service I could possibly give with every fiber of my being. They got every perk. They got a, a, a free appetizer because it was in my power to give a free appetizer and they got a level of service that was stone cold absolutely above and beyond mm. now another table got a level of service that was just enough that i wouldn't get fired yes okay. this, now, I know this <laughs> this is a rhetorical question <laughs> when i say which table got which and and uh, uh and then uh, i would say why I mean, was there a promise? Was there a monetary promise? Did I have some in incentive 
to give better service to that couple. Uh, did I know them? Were they friends? Were they family? And the answer to all that is no. So why? Why, why did I do what I, what I did? They cared, observed. Showed me respect. Mm. Showed me dignity. Uh, as you said, they took understood. a moment. They understood my situation. Right. They sublimated Related. their needs to mine for the moment right. so we could work together. Right. And when people do that, it's in response to all of those, when I say people like me, I mean, I gave, I chose, Reciprocity or- I chose to go above and beyond everything that I could do because they, I was treated that way. Mm. That is a human response. It's a, it's a, that's our lizard brain. Mm-hmm. That's how we respond to input like that. Mm. So now amplify that towards 50 employees or Those 100 24. employees or 2,000 employees or 10,000 employees. And, and you have a Zappos. Mm. You have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people applying for every single position they have open. Because everybody wants to work there. Because right. that's the kind of culture they have. And, and there isn't magic. There's not, there's, it's not like REI and, and Starbucks and Zappos have something magical about them that can't be duplicated. Absolutely, it can be replicated. I mean, I, mm-hmm. I don't want to push myself as a consultant, but any company, bring me in and my team and give me a year and you will have that culture, I guarantee it. Right. It's, it's not Proven. magical to build it. It's, re, it's, it's almost utterly intuitive. Right. That's great. Dennis, any final thoughts you want to share with our listeners before we wrap up? Oh my gosh, what would it be on? It seems like we've been east of the sun and west of the moon on this bad boy. Um, Just at the risk of restating it, just believe, if you have a company, believe that anything is possible with your culture. Mm. Don't settle. Don't settle for bad. Don't even settle for mediocre. And certainly don't settle for whatever you are, it, go ahead and say, okay, this is what we are. What would I like to be? What would make the company soar if we were A, B, C, and D? If we, could, if we were these things? I guarantee you, you can be. Mm. I, I, it, 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 it is not rocket science. It's human behavior. And it's really pretty easy to do once you figure out that all we're dealing with is showing people respect and dignity and appreciation uh, it's it's how people respond and it's really powerful stuff that's great we appreciate you coming on the show and spending time with us today uh, I enjoyed being here it's fun to talk about this stuff I sorry if I rambled but suddenly we were zinging all over the place here it's kind of fun yeah it's been great I know our listeners are going to uh, those of you that want to reach out to Dennis there'll be a way to reach out and connect with Dennis in the show notes and for that we'll just sign off and thank you for listening thanks Patrick thank you If you get a few moments, please subscribe, rate, and review this show on iTunes or on your own favorite platform. This helps others discover our program, and it tells us that we are doing a good job. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed the Multifamily Leadership Podcast. For show notes and other resources, visit multifamilyleadership.com.